yes to you this morning. We just lay it all down, Father God, and we say yes. We say yes to you. We say yes to you. Good morning, Saints. How's everybody doing today? Isn't this a wonderful place to be on a Sunday morning? Beautiful weather. We're in the house of the Lord. And it is just an amazing thing to witness and feel. Um, I'm going to try to keep this short. You all know me, right? So my wife made sure I wrote it down to keep me out of trouble. All right. And when it comes to communion... I was struggling all week trying to figure out what to come up with. So last night I sat down and I said, Lord, what do I think about when it comes to communion? All right? And my heart always goes to the prodigal. Right? So this is what I gave me seven thoughts. I'm going to read those seven and then move on. So thought number one, Christ died on the cross to reestablish fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Point number two. God loved his creation so much, he was willing to die for us to be able to walk in the garden with him once again. Isn't that amazing? Right? Because if you look at the Bible as a whole, it's about restoration, reconciliation. There's nothing about this or that. When you put it in your heart, God is trying to reconcile us back to him, right? All right, and of course, number three, it's the greatest love story ever told. You don't get no better than this. Number four, when we take communion, let us concentrate on the love story. We, the prodigals, are being restored with the blood of Jesus. Number five, those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ all sufficient sacrifice need only concentrate on him do this in remembrance of me number six christ paid it all at the cross it is finished we can go home and be reconciled to a holy and loving father who is seeking over the horizon for all who want to come home and number seven my favorite he will run to you, put a ring on your finger, kill the fatty calf, and dress you in a robe of his glory. Luke, Luke 15, right? Isn't that amazing? You don't believe me? Read, read Luke 15, where God, Jesus, is describing his nature, his love. When you read it, listen with your heart you will hear let us pray oh before I go there remember those of you who are not used to our communion there's two cups right you take both of them the bread is on the bottom and the juice is in the top I don't want you grabbing for two or three cups and then they say it was your fault because you didn't tell them right so all right so let us pray Dear Heavenly Father, precious Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we thank you. Thank you for the love story. The story that says we can always come home. You loved us enough to die on the cross to allow us that opportunity to be reconciled wholly, completely, without anything else. If we put our trust in that, blood, that blood that flows so freely for us on the cross. We thank you. We honor you. We love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Alright, we come to a time of offering time when we give from our hearts in the service of God. It is probably your best worship that you can do of all things. And uh, 
I'm going to tell you a little story. All right. Oh, there's three ways to give. I don't know if they're going to put this up for you. Uh, you can mail it in. A, you can do bill pay and some other wishes. Oh, there they are. But I'm going to tell you a story, and my life group already knows this story. So for the longest time, I used to read uh, John 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. You know, for how long of my life I've read that, <laughs> and brother, I was like, Lord, how can we do greater? How can we top the cross? There's no way. How can that be possible? Well, not long after praying that prayer, a song came to my heart that I had totally forgot about. And it was called, it was by Ray Boats. It's called Thank You. And if you get a chance, you should really listen to it. But the song describes what giving is about. And <laughs> y'all forgive me, I'm going to cry. The last stanzas of the song, it says, Jesus takes your hand and he looks at all the people that you change by giving from your heart, your time, your money. And Jesus says, great is your reward. That's something we should all strive for. Remember, that's what the giving is about. It's not about the, the, this, the, all the other things we consider. It's about great is your reward. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again. Giving us a chance to worship you and bless others. To show them that your love is far reaching than we could ever know. Help me, thank you for helping me understand that that's how we can do greater things than you. Because all it takes is blessing one, Lord. And it can reach the whole world. Thank you for this opportunity. We ask you to bless it. Let it be what you want it to be. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. morning church it's very nice to be with you this morning um, I just wanted to say we need to give a round of applause to our Heavenly Father he filled this room after a month of prayer last week all right prayers were answered you guys were faithful by putting those names on the card even more faithful by praying for those names and even brave enough to ask those people to come and they came so I just want you guys to know, God answered our prayers. Sometimes we don't always see it in our life, but we got to see it on Sunday. And that was just awesome. This room was packed. Kids area was packed. It was just so good to see God answer those prayers. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for being faithful, um, for praying. Also, we have a new email that's going to be sent out weekly. It's called the Shared Journey email. Uh, there should be a QR code up there. If you guys don't know how to do QR codes, you just open your cell phone, open your photos to your cell phone. It's okay. You guys can get your cell phones out during service right now. It's okay. Um, you go ahead and just put your camera on that screen, and it will it will send up a link. You can click that, and you can opt in to this email. It's an email that Dan's going to send out weekly, and it's just letting us know what's on the top of his mind and heart that he wants to share with us as a congregation. I'm sure he would love to call you guys each one by one, but you know, there's a lot of us. So <laughs> this is the best way to get to know his heart and his mind for our church here at Victor Valley. Um, I also, if you are new here, I just wanna say welcome and thank you so much for spending your Sunday with us. We are so privileged and honored to have you here this morning. There is a blue connect card in the seat back in front of you. If you wouldn't mind filling that out for me, my name is Jessica, I'm the Connections Director here, and um, I would love to meet you. If that is something you would love to do, I'll be over here at Guest Central 
in the back corner of the sanctuary. And I'd love to meet you and just get to know your name and, and get to know your story. If you don't, you can go to Guest Relations and uh, turn it in there. And we would love to meet or pray for you, uh, whatever your needs are. I'm going to pray for service, and then Dan can come up and, and uh, finish out the service this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much just for your answered prayers, your, um, your just wisdom, Lord, that you've given us to, and faith that you've given us just to help us uh, through this Easter service. Um, I also just want to pray that for this service, Lord, for this peace sermon, that we just have our, our eyes and hearts open for you, Lord, and that we just are, are willing to listen and to take this and just move it out through the week. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you speak through Dan, you anoint him, Lord, and his words, that we can just take them and just do powerful things with him, Lord. In your heavenly name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jessica. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, she said about Easter is just uh, well done, church. I mean, that was just something. As a pastor, I get, a, I get to get with a group of other pastors, and we talked about how Easter went. I got to brag about you guys and say, we prayed for four weeks, and then God answered the prayer, and we filled the room together. And it was, So that's just such an important thing because we're on a shared journey, and we got to have that first kind of victory where God's like blessing what we're doing. And, and it was just such an awesome thing. And, and so I just want to thank you for being a part of that. But I do want to take a moment to praise God for what he did last week in bringing people here. So this is giving me a hand. Thank you, God. We get nothing if not through him. Um, so what now? So what do we talk about now that we did that? We, you, know, uh, you know, we hit the ground running and we're talking about getting to Easter and Easter came and it went. And, and so for me, the only thing you can really preach on Easter is the hope of the gospel. Like that's like an obvious thing. So I was thinking, what's the next conversation anyone needs to have after a gospel presentation? And, and I think it's important because you think about the term discipleship and understanding what it means. A lot of times we accept Christ or we hear the gospel, but that's it. And so I don't want to be that church. I think anytime we invite people to accept Christ, and we had, we had a, a person come forward, we had a person get baptized, we had a few comment cards out there that said they accepted Christ, that's great. But there's people who have accepted Christ, maybe people in this room, that after they did so, no one really told them what was next. They just expect them to show up to church and they started doing the church thing. And I think there's some things that we said in the invitation prayer that are important when we invite God to send his spirit to us, his Holy Spirit to fill us, to make us alive and to make us new. And we covered some of those scriptures last week. But what does that look like in our everyday life? And it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. Maybe it's been a week. Maybe it's been decades. Maybe, it, you know, maybe you can't remember when you accepted Christ because you're raised in a Christian home. It just happened. But it doesn't matter. All of us are kind of in the same boat when it comes to finding peace. And so that's the idea of the next few weeks. We're going to talk about what does peace mean? Because you think about a lot of things going on in the world, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of peace. Yet Jesus promises peace. And so there's a unique peace that Jesus promises, but... It's not the kind of peace that the world gives. And in fact, he says that in John 14, 27, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. That is such a profound promise in our world today. And I, I find it interesting that, you know, most of the things that we do we deal with anxiety, we deal with uncertainty, we deal with what's next, what's going, what's going to happen. And Jesus is like, no, 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 I promise peace to you. And it's hard to grasp. I mean, I struggle with it. My family struggles with it. We struggle with anxiety to the point of sometimes medication and, and you know, sleepless nights. I struggle with insomnia, things that, and it's like, all right, God, where's your peace? I want to find it. And sometimes it's, it's, it seems like, I don't know if you guys remember, and this will date you if you do, uh, the Looney Tune cartoons where Bugs Bunny has like a stick that looks like a Y and he's looking for water and it's a divining rod. And we're looking for peace that way. And it's actually not too far off of that. There's times where you wonder like, God, why is this not happening? Or when is this going to happen? Or all the other things, how, all those questions. And we don't have a peace about it. And I think it's sometimes we misunderstand what Jesus is talking about here. And the peace he gives 
can be better translated as harmony or tranquility, not quiet. We mistake peace for quiet. Especially if you're a young parent, you understand what I mean, right? You know, you sleep when they sleep, right? You just want, you do anything for quiet, just quiet in the house. But we never really grow out of that. We're fighting for just that quiet moment. And that's okay. It's okay to have quiet moments. But that's not the peace Jesus is talking about. And when we expect quiet instead of peace, we're going to get frustrated. How many people do you know, or maybe you're one of them, that gets mad at God for not giving you your peace? As if you decide and he's just supposed to show up like some kind of cosmic vending machine where you get to push your button and you get mad when the candy bar doesn't fall down and you start shaking it. That's not how God works. And so I thought it would be good to have this conversation over different topics of our life. How does this Holy Spirit allow us to find Jesus' peace? He promised it, so why don't we have it? Because he doesn't give it. There's contingencies there, and it's his peace, but it's how he sanctifies us. And the word sanctify has to do with separating. It's how he begins to, when we pray that prayer, make me alive, make me new, and he gives us the Holy Spirit, it's how he begins to start to transform us. It's how he begins to change us. You know, you know, it's been said that everyone wants to grow, but they don't want to change. Well, that's counterintuitive, isn't it? And so how do we grow? How do we do this? Well, we, we do it through constant surrender. But where does that peace come into that? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And Jesus gives this warning that kind of highlights, I'm not talking about quiet. He makes it really clear. And so we talked about how a couple of weeks ago about hospitality, how Jesus started with that lesson in the, in the Last Supper of hospitality for leaders. And then he moves on to other topics, but here's a topic he has in John 16 in that same conversation. On his way to being arrested, he has these things at the top of his mind that he wants to get off his chest. He wants to prepare his apostles and disciples for what's to come. And if you turn to John chapter 16, if you have your Bibles today, we're going to spend some time there. He says this, These things I have spoken to you that you may be kept from stumbling. He knows things are going to happen that they did not expect. See, they wanted Jesus to be king of the world right then and to conquer Rome and do all those things. So this is not, you're going to be sorely disappointed. And he's setting them up for this. He says, they will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who, who kills you to think that they're offering service to God. So there's going to be a time coming where they're going to be outcast. And they're going to say why. And, they're going to, and Jesus is letting them know this is why. They think they're doing what God wants. And so he's not promising quiet. This, this came two chapters later. Same conversation where he says, my peace I give to you, by the way, you're going to be outcasts. By the way, they're going to be on a manhunt for you, a religious manhunt for you. He's actually foreshadowing a little bit of what Paul the Apostle is going to do as Saul. In verse 3, he says, these things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you, so that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning, because I was with you. So then he promises something. He promises the Holy Spirit. So he warns them that a tough time is coming. And then he promises the Holy Spirit in verse 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you. Remember that, that divining rod? He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. The next part, he promises the power of prayer. So he's giving them, he says, look, it's going to be tough, but I'm going to give you my spirit, and when you pray, it's going to do something. And in that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father of anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be full. He's, he's referencing a time where they're going to be under a great tribulation, a great persecution. And he says, I need you to, to receive the Spirit, and I need you to pray, and your joy will be full. So that's not the kind of quiet we're looking for. But there's a peace, there's a harmony and tranquility to know that God knows, God cares, and God's got this. And there's a, there's a time where it's like, no, Jesus, I want you to be king and conquer Rome. Conquer these Pharisees that are, are going after you. 
And Jesus is like, no, that's not my plan. But here's my plan, and here's how I'm going to take care of you. And so if, if in, in our context, if we think about something we want versus what God wants, that divining rod, there's no peace where we want when it doesn't line up with what God wants. So how much of our life lacks peace because we're fighting for our own agenda? God is God. Job's not open. He gets to do what he wants to do. It's called sovereignty. And so what he says is this. He says, I'm going to send you my spirit, and he's going to guide you to my will, and then you're going to pray my will, and then you're going to have the peace no matter what's going on around you. Our allegiance to God can't be contingent upon us getting our way. That's when we, get, that's when we lose the peace. When you talk about Jesus' unique peace, it's found in his will. It's found in conjunction with living by the Spirit. And that takes practice. I don't care if you've been a Christian a week or all your life, that takes practice. The Holy Spirit gives us God's will in our heart, and we can sit there and we can think about what God wants. And the promise of peace despite tribulation comes in John 16, uh, 32 through 33, where he says this, Behold, an hour is coming and has already come. And he's talking about his imminent arrest. For you will be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. So he's saying the worst is about to happen, and I'm fine. I have peace. These things I have spoken to you. He says this in verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. It's about playing the long game. Our peace is knowing that Christ has the victory. All of our things in our life that rob us of that peace, it's because we're thinking in the short term. Jesus cares, Jesus sees, and he wants us to see it from his perspective. You know, I've talked to somebody earlier today, when are we going to stop caring for our kids? We're not. We shouldn't. But we got to surrender stuff like that to God. Sometimes we worry about our jobs or where we're going to get food and all those different things. But Jesus keeps saying, no, if you seek first the kingdom, all those other things will take care of itself. That's the peace he promises. How much do you trust me will determine how much peace you'll actually have. Because the further you get from trusting me and doing it on your own agenda, the less peace you're going to have. And the reason that happens is he's not going to affirm us if we're off track. I don't know if you've ever done this. I've done this. When you're doing something explicitly against God's will, I'm not going to tell you what it is. But when you go over here and you have this like, oh, I don't feel good about this, but you do it anyway, God's not going to be like, oh, go ahead. It's awesome. It's fine. You'll come back. No, he's going to let you wrestle. He's going to have this lack of peace. And, and so when you come back to him, which you always can, you're always, you can take 10,000 steps away from the Lord and struggle, struggle, struggle. You're only one step away back to peace when you come back and say, all right, your way, not my way. C.S. Lewis said every person's going to say um, something. God will either say, your will be done, away from me, or we will say, your will be done, and go towards him. He's a gentleman. He doesn't force it, but he doesn't allow us to get away with it. And the peace that we feel in our spirit is part of that. And you're saying, I don't know if I feel that all the time. But the hour, not the day. Notice that. He says the hour, not the day. He says there's not going to be a day. He says it's imminent. There's always times. This is minute to minute that you're discerning the Holy Spirit. It's not just one day. It's not just times. It's not just whatever. There's people that get so close to the Lord that they feel it minute by minute. And it's because they make intentional decisions to say, Jesus, you're my Lord. Now, not all of us are there. and Not all of us do it all the time. There's not this moment where you get baptized and now you're in the spirit and life's just easy because you're finding all the peace. That's not how it works, is it? No, it's us committing every day saying, your will be done, not mine. And so that's where we find the unique peace that Jesus gives us. Now, there's this thing called the fruit of the Spirit. And this will help us understand that divining rod. This will help us understand. It's almost like you're doing a taste test. And think about this. And there's a reason, because there's a, there's a misapplication of this sometimes. But in Galatians 5, through 23, we get a list of things that are the fruit of the Spirit. Now, people will say these are fruits of the Spirit. Actually, the word is singular. It's fruit of the Spirit. So when you talk about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, that's not like 
apple, orange, strawberry, pineapple. That's not how it goes. It's all one fruit. And so it, all these things are like having that one fruit, and then you could taste that fruit in other things. It's the flavor of that fruit, if you think of it that way. Um, you know, you can take a strawberry and figure out if there's strawberry in something. You know, it could be a strawberry pie, a strawberry smoothie. Think of the list more like that versus different fruits. The spirit has a specific flavor. And so when you sense that flavor, you know that that's God's path. That's where peace is going to be found. We'll talk about a different list later that probably doesn't taste very good. But love, agape, unconditional love, that's a specific thing in our life. When we are able to have unconditional love for someone, that is a fruit of the Spirit. Prior to having the Spirit, we can't do the fruit of the Spirit because our motives were wrong. Before you're a Christian, before you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, all the good things we do are usually for selfish reasons. That, now think about that. The stuff I did before was for me to get my way. But now when you have the fruit of the Spirit, you do these things that you normally wouldn't do. It's out of character. Why? Because God's making you new. And so when I love someone unconditionally, which is not usually what people do, now I have the ability to do it based on the Spirit. That's me and the Spirit lining up together, loving someone unconditionally. Joy. Having that joy. It's just this general gratefulness. There's just this time. Like I was thinking this last, I had this amazing joy at Easter last week. Um, and we're sitting here and we're doing this invitation. Not many people are coming forward. I just had this amazing joy. I was just so grateful. So many people were in the room, had access to the gospel, and you guys were all a part of that. I was just generally grateful. I, was, I wasn't thinking about any one thing. I was just grateful in the moment. There might be times where you're sitting there and you're just appreciative of all, all God gave you. That's a fruit of the Spirit. That's a contentment that doesn't come unless you're a Christian. Because most of the time, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you say, well, what you got, you want another, <laughs> right? That's what some millionaire said a long time ago. I think it was Henry Ford said, hey, you got your first million dollars. What's next? He goes, my next million. No, the fruit of the Spirit is, I'm just grateful for what I got. Generally, not one spe specific thing. I'm just praising God. Why? I just, I'm just grateful. That's joy. And that's despite anything else. That's despite any challenges happening. That's a fruit of the Spirit. Peace, that's what we're talking about. Tranquility, just having this general sense of calm. Kindness. This is an interesting word because it's more, instead of just someone being nice, that's different. Nice is not kind, actually. Nice sometimes lies to people. Kindness is usefulness. I've never really thought of it that way until I studied this. Kindness is when you see somebody has a need, you go help them. You become useful. You ever been around someone who's just standing there and they're completely unuseful? They're being unkind. So kindness is a usefulness where you're like, you see someone, you're just like, oh, please let me help you. That's a fruit of the Spirit. That, that tastes like the Holy Spirit right there. That's part of that. That's not something maybe some of us would normally do. Or maybe we did it with wrong motives where we want to look like we're useful. Goodness. This one we're going to talk about next week a little more. Uh, Mitch touched on a little bit today. But the idea of generosity. People don't think about goodness as generosity. We think about this. The idea of goods and services. These are Services are things you do for someone. Goods are things you give away. Now, maybe you sold them, but goods, generosity, your goodness is your ability to say what, what's mine is yours without thinking about it, without thinking about getting paid back. There's something good about that. That's the goodness of God. Faithfulness. Are we people who are trustworthy? Because when we're here for other people, that, that's, that Holy Spirit moment, there's been this time, and you talk about times where you're wondering if you have peace or not, where... What, you're, what you've committed to has now become inconvenient, and now you're looking for a reason to get out of it, right? So my integrity is inconvenient. I have a peace about staying in my commitment even though I don't want to. It's like one of those moments, oh, man, I wish I could, but I don't really feel like it, you know? It's, I just don't want to do it, but I've committed to it. Or maybe someone's expecting me to fulfill it. A fruit of the Spirit is saying, no, I'll stick with it. I'm going to do the thing someone's expecting me to do. When we don't, and think about this, the first time you quit something, it's really hard to do because there's no peace in it. The next time you quit something, it's kind of easier. And then you get easier. And then it gets easier. Pretty soon, you're a quitter. You're not trustworthy. But here's the thing. 
The, what that demonstrates, that's a good example of the idea of quenching the Spirit. See, the Spirit is like a water of life that just keeps feeding into us the will of God and the thoughts of God and the mind of God into our heart. And so when we're at, a, we're, when we're at odds with the Spirit, because that's what we're talking about, there's a war inside of us, and we're going to get to that in a second. We're at odds with the Spirit. The Spirit wants to go, wants to flow. But there's times, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, and I'm talking about not being trustworthy of saying, no, I got to get out of this. You take this, it's almost like the water's coming through a garden hose, and when you want to do what you want to do and just say, hey, God, I need you to stop. And we crimp that hose, and we stop that flow. And now we're going off our own understanding, our own want, our own desire, living like we did before we had the Spirit, because that was easier. That's what it means to grieve the Spirit. That's what it means to... Um, just shut it off. And the more you do that, the reason why when you quit something, it's tough because you still have the spirit working with you. But once you start crimping that hose, our heart, our heart gets hard. Like it's almost like it's a piece of soil. When the, when the, when the water's pouring on it, the Holy Spirit water's pouring on it, it starts to soften it. And God's able to plant seeds of things that he wants, this fruit that he wants in there. But when we crimp that hose, the Holy Spirit stops flowing. He doesn't leave you. He just stops having influence on your heart. Your heart will dry up and will be hard. That's why the things we do become easier. And we wonder why we don't have peace. Gentleness, that's just simply humility. And self-control. It's funny. I was looking for self-control. I was looking up like translated also as self-control. So it's, it's all self-control means. But it really just does mean saying no to self. The Holy Spirit helps us say no to things that on our own we would not. That's why when Jesus says, when I send you the Spirit, the Helper, he's going to stop you in moments when you're struggling. He's going to bring to mind things. And, and so that's when you talk about peace. I, I have this problem with self-control with ice cream. If it's in my freezer, it will call my name. <laughs> Doesn't matter what I'm doing. I could be laying in bed. I could be watching a TV show, and now I'm distracted because I'm just listening to this ice cream. That's not self-control. I need the Holy Spirit to tell me, don't buy the ice cream. Or buy it in smaller amounts so you don't have any left over. That's what you do. You end up you know, eating all of it so it doesn't call your name later, but you ate it anyway. <laughs> but we all laugh because we all know that's not the fruit of the Spirit. So understanding this, understanding the idea that there's a war inside of us, there's a thing that causes us to lack peace. Now, get this. Our hearts, no matter how long you've been a Christian— it's con constantly being conquered by Christ. It doesn't happen all at once. Jesus knows. He, he, he sanctifies a piece at a time. There's probably something, when you became a Christian, you saw an immediate change in you. And for me, I had that. I had things that immediately changed, but then there were things that I struggled with. And then eventually, I got better at that, and then there's another thing. He doesn't want to overwhelm us. God is such a gentleman. He does not force these things on us. He has far more grace for us than we have for ourselves. But... He takes this one step at a time. So that means no matter how long you've been a Christian, you've got something to work on, and God's working on something in you. All of us, if you think of our hearts, not as a soil, but maybe a house. We just got a, a, a new house, by the way. So praise God for that. You guys have been praying. So we got 30 days. We'll be, we'll be excited to be there and, and have everybody over at some point. Somebody asked me, he's like, oh, you're going to do a house warming? Make sure I'm invited. I'm like, yeah, you know I'm going to figure out a way to invite everybody. We're going to get everybody there at some point. But... Um, when you have a house, say you do come over to my house and you see a door that's locked, that's not, there's no access. It's almost like Jesus comes into our house and we say, yeah, have at it. These, all these rooms, uh, not this one. And I don't know about you, but some people have junk drawers. They look like they have it all together and you're like, and Jesus wants to see that junk drawer. Some people have whole junk rooms, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. Our hearts are that way. That's what sanctification. Jesus goes in and puts things in order along. And it's like Jesus can decorate every room in the house except for this one. And so that's where we have peace. And Jesus is like, I'm, not, I'm just going to stand awkwardly at this door. We're not going to have peace. I want in. And, you, and that's the struggle we have when we lack peace in our life. And that peace that he promises us only comes when we unlock those doors. And they all come in their timing. Everything's perfect in its timing. But Paul, I think about this. Paul, the apostle, when he wrote the book of Romans, he wrote Romans chapter 7. And he describes, and tell, I'm going to read it to you. It's a little lengthy, but I, I think it's something you can relate to. And it gives me peace knowing that Paul struggled the same way. But what he talks about is a dual nature, where we have the Holy Spirit that's now come into us, but we still have this thing called the flesh 
that wars against the Spirit. And it's us. It's, our, it's who we are. And Paul had this, this humility, which is a fruit of the Spirit, to be able to say these things in the book of Romans. Turn to Romans chapter 7, verse 14. He's, he's talking about himself here. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold in bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. He's talking about self-control there. He's talking about something he's struggling with. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, saying, I know what's right. God's Spirit's in me telling me it's wrong. Confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, my flesh. But that is my flesh. For the willing is present in me, the Holy Spirit, and my spirit. But the doing of good is not. My flesh holds me back. For the good that I want, I do not do. This is verse 19. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. Verse 20. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but the sin which dwells in me. He's referring to a time where he didn't even struggle. He just did it. And he didn't think it was wrong. And now he thinks it's wrong and he still does it. He's confused by that. There's people who are like, oh yeah, you know, Pastor, help me. I'm, I'm struggling with porn and this and that. And I was like, so, okay, so how many times do you watch it? Like three times a day. I'm like, you're not struggling with porn. You, you've given in. Like, we need to start struggling a little better. And so that's the concept of you're not struggling if you're constantly doing it. And, and if we're justifying it. But Paul's, Paul's sitting here saying, I'm struggling. I don't, I, I'm not doing what I want to do. But in verse 21, it says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, our flesh, the one who wants to do good, our spirit. For I joyfully concur that the law of God in the inner man, with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body. Now get this, waging war, lack of peace, against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am. Think about that. Wretched man that I am, who will free me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I am myself with my mind, am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. The idea that even though he doesn't want to, but has to, shows that bondage. And he's asking God, wretched man that I am, thinking about that, thinking about how bad we can be. It's not a, and a lot of times as Christians, we can look out in the world and say, oh, how terrible the world is. The world is a terrible influence, but there's two other influences that cause sin. The world, the enemy, Satan, but the number one place where we have sin problems is our own flesh and our own desire. And Paul, Paul's talking about that. He's saying, wretched man that I am, that I have these things. You know, it's good to think about that. We are all saints positionally in God's eyes. We're clean because of the blood of Christ. But we still are wrestling with this body that inherited sin from Adam. So our sins are forgiven, but God's working out in us how to walk that way. And so what do those things look like? What exactly is that? Galatians 5.17 says this, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. So he's referencing that Romans 7 topic right here in Galatians in another, another letter to another church. And in Galatians 5, he, he describes what the Spirit isn't. So here's the divining rod. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit, the flavor, what it tastes like. Here's the opposite of that. So we know where we are in the Spirit. Immorality. This is where we get the word pornography. It's porneia. Sexual, sinful behavior. Anything that's outside of marriage... That would not be of the Spirit. That would not be something God would be um, looking for. Impurity, filth, unclean, deviant. Impurity, you think, what's the difference between immorality and impurity? And, you know, uh, Pastor Chuck Boer, he was a, a, he's at Crossroads Christian Church now. He was our uh, college pastor. I remember he gave a good illustration of impurity. And it really helped me as a young Christian to understand it to learn how to walk in the spirit and to consider these things. And I think it is a matter of perspective because when we want to do something, we'll justify it, right? And so he gave this story of this 17-year-old girl who wanted to go see a rated R movie. And she's going with her friends and she's all excited to see this movie. 
And she goes to her mom and dad, and she goes, hey, we're going to go see such and such movie. I can't remember what it was, but it's rated R. And she goes, oh, it's rated R? Um, why do you want to go see that? And she goes, well, it seems like a really good story. She goes, so what's, why is it rated R? She goes, well, just a little bit, of, a little bit of sex, a little bit of nudity, but it's just a little. And she's like, okay. Well, when are you guys going? Well, later tonight. She goes, all right, this afternoon, ask me again. And so the mom baked a pan of brownies. And so when, when she came to her, she says, hey, so you still want to see that movie? And she said, yes. And she goes, look, I'll make a deal with you. If you eat one of these brownies, I'll let you go see that movie. And she's like, oh, okay. And she goes, wait, before you do, I want you to know that I took a little piece of what the cat put in the litter box inside the brownies. If you eat, the, if you eat a brownie, you can go watch that movie. She didn't go watch that movie. That's the, that's, that's the definition, word picture of impurity. So you think about, everyone has different sensitivities and things like that, but I'm a big movie freak. I love stories. I love all these things. And I get so frustrated when there's just that little piece of whatever the cat put in the litter box in my movie. And I can't go see it. And so those are things when you say, oh, I want to do it. I'll justify it. I'll just fast forward. I'll close my eyes. I'll look away. No, it's, in, it's impure sensuality is unrestrained. It's the opposite of self-control. It's if it feels good, do it. Think about the world. That's of the flesh. And, and basically it's, God, I don't care what you say. I think it feels good. I'm going to do it. That's that war. That's that peace, that lack of peace that's there. Idolatry, that is spiritual inf infidelity. That's letting something other than the word of God rule over authority in your life. And people have that. And, and sometimes it doesn't look like religion. Sometimes it looks like social media. Sometimes it looks like um, cable news. Sometimes it looks like a lot of things. But if it doesn't line up with Scripture, that's not going to be. That's idolatry. Sorcery. Do you know the word sorcery is pharmakia? It's where we get the word pharmacy. A lot of people think, oh, I don't have any Harry Potter things going on in my life. No, but drugs. Um, lack of sobriety. That would be something that's of the flesh. Enmities, this is hostility. This is constantly being um, hostile to other people. Strife, this is where people divide and exclude. This is where people find a reason not to welcome people. It's the opposite of hospitality. Jealousy is intense envy. Some people say, no, it's good to be jealous. God is a jealous God. Yeah, he has intense envy to keep us out of evil. But we're not to have that. Outbursts of anger, this would be rage. You know, the, the, you know I always use the example of road rage or people cutting you off. That moment, you're not in the spirit if you're giving them hand signals. Disputes. <laughs> Selfish ambition. So a dispute usually has to do with motive there, where it's, you know, you're trying to get, the, you're trying to get your way some way, whether it's the, the promotion or the, the job that you want or the raise that you want. You're competing against someone. That's a, that, that unhealthy competition is a dispute. Factions. The word there is, is, is really specifically speaking of heresy where people split on the word of God and someone's teaching it wrong and it's clear. You know, they, 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 you know the old saying goes when they teach people how, in the banks how to detect counterfeits, you know what they do? They never show them a counterfeit. They only show them the, word, the, the real thing. So when the counterfeit comes, it's very recognizable. Heresy is a weird looking hundred dollar bill and people sense it and they know it. But people divide over that. Drunkenness. Why would drunkenness be on this list? And by the way, it's translated also as drunkenness. It's pretty simple. <laughs> it's when you lose sobriety. The drugs part, people have asked me, what do you think about drugs versus alcohol? Well, you can't smoke a little weed and not get high. But you can drink a little alcohol and not lose your sobriety. Drunkenness is that line. It doesn't say drinking alcohol, by the way, does it? It says drunkenness. When you lose your sobriety, you can't feel the Holy Spirit. When you're depending upon other things to deal with that lack of peace, when someone says, I don't have peace, what do they say? I need a drink. What do they say? I need to do this. I need to do that. All this list are things that we self-medicate without praying, without drawing near to God and looking for his unique peace. This is peace that you can't get from Jesus. And the last thing is carousing. Carousing is partying. And the idea of carousing is you're going out seeking any of those other things on the list. You're actively quenching that garden hose and putting it down and saying, I'm going to go do what I need to do. That will not bring peace in our life. And the way we know this is if you indulge in any one of those things of the flesh, immediately after, 
you don't have peace. But when you have the fruit of the Spirit, over and over again, that's how you find your peace. I'm going to end on this. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 says this, and I love this passage. In verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So always means not when it's good, not when it's bad, always. Let your gentle spirit, fruit of the spirit, be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. I love that passage. For someone that struggles with anxiety, when you can say be anxious for nothing, that means when you have anxiety, that's a clear indication that you're not in the spirit. It means you have to draw near to God. God never gives us that anxiety. We put ourselves there. He says, come over here by me. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication. That's how you draw close to him. If we find anxiety in our life by everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. You don't have to take that drink. You don't have to self-medicate. You don't have to go looking for things. I'm right here. Pray. And the peace of God. So see, that's the result. When you're anxious, pray. Be grateful. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. All that long list of the flesh stuff, when we practice prayer looking for that peace, it starts to eliminate those things. You develop appetites for things you indulge in. And people say, well, I don't get the same peace from praying as I do from smoking a joint or drinking or, or going out. Well, that's because you, you need an appetite for it. Stop that and start doing this, and you'll start to develop an appetite for it. You'll start to understand it. It's not a magic pill. It doesn't happen just like that. We expect God to do that. No, it takes practice. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, this is how we do it. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good, of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul saying this to the Philippians, when you're struggling, do what you saw me do. All of us have, as Christians, why is the peace thing so important? Because people are watching us. If you're a mom and dad, your kids are watching how you handle peace. You want to raise them in a godly home? Do it in a godly way. Pray. Seek the peace. Don't replace it with that other stuff. Everyone's got eyes on you. The second you say, I'm a Christian, that's what they're looking for. Why do they call us hypocrites? Because we do the other lists that we, they know we shouldn't be doing. But we should be able to say to somebody someday, hey, I know you're anxious right now. Do what I do. Pray. Pray. Let me pray with you. Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, to, indeed, um, to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. And I just want to leave you with this, where we started. John 14.27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled nor let it be fearful. You know, I caught something in Mitch's devotion today when he was talking in the offering. And it makes a difference. He was talking about how he was reading a passage of scripture and he didn't understand it and he asked God, what does this mean? And then God gave him a song. If you're here today and you're like, man, I, I need to get this right. The best thing you can do to start is do what Mitch did every day. Start reading your Bible every day. If you've gotten away from that, it's okay. Just start again. And, and it's like going back to the gym if you haven't been in a while. Don't read a whole book of the Bible. Read a verse. One of my favorite things to tell people is read, if you're starting new and you've never done it before, start reading the book of Proverbs. There's 31 chapters. So whatever day it is of the month, start reading that one. It's not consecutive. You're not missing out on the story. Just drop in. But when you commit to being in God's word, the Holy Spirit starts to flow. He 
He begins to start to change your heart. He begins to bring those things up. He begins to jiggle the handle on that door you have locked that you don't want Jesus in on. And then so what I do is I'll just read, I'll pick one thing. I'll ask God, show me the one thing in my passage today. And then I'll talk to him about it. I don't talk about my wife. I don't talk about my kids. I do that later in a prayer time. But I want want you to show me, search in me any anxious thoughts, any unclean way. If you do that every day, each one of those days will be like a drip. And pretty soon you're a well of living water that can be there for someone else you care about. And so we get to be that example. When we find peace, we want to be the example of a person who's found peace. Because there's people in our lives, people you prayed for that got invited to Easter, all eyes are on you. It's not about pressure. It's about being Jesus to them. So I think if if we can all be a church, we became a church on a shared journey. Then we we worked on being an invite culture church, and we did that. But I would love for us to be a church that is committed to being a spirit-led church. And you can't be a spirit-led church if you're not bearing the fruit of the spirit. And you can't do that if we're not in our word. So let's commit to being our word every day. I'm not going to, you guys are grown-ups, just like I don't tell you what to wear, I'm not going to tell you what to read. Eventually there'll be some reading plans that will go down if you need one. But just try it. I dare you. We can become a church that lives God's will in a way that gets noticed and reaches people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for just this body that you call your bride, specifically here in Victor Valley. God, I love the fact that we're called Victor Valley Christian Church. That someone had a vision to reach this valley, this entire region for you. And it begins each day in all of our hearts as we call you, Lord. And we say your will be done, not ours. God, I pray as we go in our week that each person in this room would seek you just a little more this week. That you would speak to their hearts, that they would begin to feel your spirit, changing them and making them alive in you. Help us be a church that makes you smile because we're that way. In your name we pray, Jesus. spirit in your heart this morning. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. 
up early in the morning, Father God. Show us where those times are where we can take advantage of that time and spend it with you, Father God, that we would be filled with your spirit. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, you guys have a great week.